And so what intended on being a five minute kind of just like, hey, how give us an update so we know kind of how you're doing turned into my first interview. It was awesome. Like, I mean, it, it was it was fun. It allowed a story to be told in a way that was very respectful, important, and give gave given a lot of information. I'm all about storytelling. I think it's I think that is important as education about ADHD is by understanding the science behind it. I mean, let's face it. Would we rather hear a lecture about statistics on ADHD or, or would we rather hear a bunch of stories that, that kind of show what those statistics mean in real life? ADHD Rewired, episode number 65. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. So you know that ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. It's also a coaching and accountability group. And now that we are going into the third rendition of the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group, we are signing up people right now for the summer session. Uh, right now I'm recording this. It is May 22nd and we are set to begin June 15th and people are already signing up and space is limited. But in case you're kind of not sure what this group is about, um, instead of me telling you about the, the benefits of the group, I actually I had a conversation this week with Natalie, who I'm going to introduce you to and actually share a conversation with you that I had with her. Natalie is a professional organizer out of Canada, and uh, one thing she doesn't struggle with is organization. Uh, her office it looks amazing. and um, But I want to share with you a conversation I had with her just regarding her experience in the group. So, um, you know, I like to share stories. So this is her story. I'm Natalie Petticelli. I'm a professional organizer working with the ADHD community. I have ADHD myself. And uh, one of the reasons I joined was to improve my productivity. One of the top challenges I had was I made the to-do list, but I didn't stick with it. It was more like, oh, I'll get to it. And then I would get sidetracked with some of the daily stuff, such as the home management things, because it's totally different when you're your own boss working from home, as opposed to when you're working for a large corporation from home. When you're your own business, the boss is you and the you say, oh, I'll just take five minutes to do this and off you go and get sidetracked. So it's uh, definitely helped me, the group, stay become much more productive and uh, really stick to my list. I do a lot more planning ahead of time than I used to do. And that's uh, where I've seen a big improvement for me. And having that accountability, a partner to check in with, and somebody who really understands how your brain works, and uh, you know, having that synergy with somebody who also speaks at the same speed as you do and thinks as fast as you do. And it's just like, finally, I can talk without feeling like that oddball at. I think for me, the main priority is having like said, an anchor, uh, a check-in, even if it's once or twice a week, you know, is to say that, okay, I've got to be there on that call at that time. So it's one of those days where I did get up a little later than I should, really should have. Uh, I at least will be up and it forces me to get dressed because it's on video. So I'm not doing it in my pajamas. Uh, that's another reason why I did it. And uh, it keeps me going and having that community. Having worked with the same group, eight out of 12 of us have re-signed, which is, I think, a testament to how good um, your sessions are, Eric. And I really strongly recommend people to sign up for that reason alone. And uh, we've now developed such a bond and a depth, and we have all different profiles. It really allows us to continue, not have to restart, and that's the advantage of going into the second session. So, And my partner's in Sweden, and we work with the time zones, and I think it's really fantastic. And you did an amazing job at matching us up with the, our accountability partners. Uh, well, I've learned that uh, I have a lot of problems in common that a lot of ADHDers struggle with. Aside, uh, organization is one of the ones I do not have a problem with, but uh, sleeping, you know, having proper sleep hygiene is definitely a challenge. I think I heard several of our group uh, having issues with. And uh, the other one too is um, punctuality. I've always struggled with it. I'm much better 
uh, than I used to be. Now I'm within five or 10 minutes for an appointment as opposed to maybe half an hour. So it's uh, it's something that I saw and it's a constant struggle. It's one thing to read about it in the magazines. Another thing you see, we have professionals from all walks of life. We have stay-at-home moms, we had students, we had lawyers, we had uh, people working in university context and engineers, and they all have pretty much the same issues when it comes to marital issues you know we all have struggles communication because we don't talk and process the same way and uh, so it, it's nice to have discovered that okay I'm not just uh, you know that weird person that there's somebody else out there um, who's with semi issues so I'm Natalie Petticelli I'm a professional organizer for the ADHD population and I have ADHD so I understand how your brain works um, my website is www.metamorphoseorganisation.com. Sorry, it's a little bit of a French there spelling. So it's M E T A M O R P H O S E S organization with an S.com. So I highly recommend to take Eric's group. It uh, will definitely improve your productivity, and everybody who's been in the group clearly saw an improvement because you know, eight out of 12 re signed. Natalie, thank you so much for talking with me about your experience in the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. I'd love to talk to you if you're interested in joining this group. We are beginning to fill up and we are going to begin to start before you know it. Space is limited. If you're thinking about it, don't wait. You can contact me a couple of ways. You can email me at eric at erictivers.com. You can call me at 224-993-9450. That's 224-993-9450. Or go to my website. You can go directly to coachingrewired.com. Again, that's coachingrewired.com. And this summer, prepare to get your ADHD rewired. Oh, one more thing. If you're not on my email list, uh, make sure you sign up because I'm going to be uh, announcing a, a webinar coming up in the next week or two. I haven't figured out all the details, so make sure you are on my email list so you do get notification of any webinars when they are announced. Well, the webinar will be free, by the way. So I look forward to uh, seeing you then. And now that I put it out there, I got to be accountable to make that happen. Now, let's get on with the episode. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's interview, we're going to kind of rewire this interview. I have back on the show, Carolyn Dargenio. You heard Carolyn a few episodes ago. We were talking about um, type 1 diabetes. And um, what, what was the name of your episode? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> so neither of us know lost in hope, ADHD and type one diabetes. Um, I had iTunes open in the background. Um, okay. so I was able to cheat. So here's what we're going to do. Um, and I've, I've been wanting to do this for a while. And, um, so I asked Carolyn, no, I asked Carolyn uh, a couple of days ago, maybe yesterday when I realized, and it's not the first time I've been in this position where it's like made way through the week and, I realized, oh, I don't have a guest to interview. Um, so then I, you know, tapped Carolyn. I uh, said, "Hey, you want to uh, let's let's do something." And so we kind of bounced some ideas around. And then she says, "Hey, how about I interview you?" And I said, "Great." And here we are. Welcome that, that to was, the show. That was that was like a painful introduction. <laughs> I'm gonna keep it in though. <laughs> no, keep it in. Yep. You know um, what, why I wanted to interview you because well you've been doing this for over a year now yeah and there's been a lot of growth in me as a listener over the year um i've seen growth in in you as a podcaster um in the people in the adhd rewired facebook community you know and there's a lot of of people who are also new to this and maybe they don't understand the mission behind the group. Uh, maybe they don't know, you know, the man behind the voice. Um, so I thought it would be a good opportunity for you to 
introduce yourself again. Okay. All right. And um, you, know, you told me that your your main objective was to try to make me cry. No. No, it you was never not. said that. <laughs> it's possible though. I, I I have been known to be a crier. It's okay. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know what? Well, I'm six I... foot one. Um, <laughs> I'm um, I'm two hundred pounds. That's a little bit of a lie. Um, I I like long walks on the beach, and um... awful, awful. <laughs> <laughs> So now that you've gotten that out of your system. Oh, yeah. So you introduce yourself as a um, licensed clinical social worker, a, a coach, yes. Yes. consultant. Yes. What's the difference okay. among that? Um, so as a licensed clinical social worker, uh, I'm, into my, I'm a trained therapist. Um, I work with uh, individuals, kids and adults, with families in my office. Um, and we, you know, work on, I mean, there's definitely an overlap between, um, especially when I'm working around issues of ADHD, uh, between therapy and coaching. Um, one, you know, uh, a distinction is in therapy, we're really looking at more some of the emotional uh, components of, um, you know, the things that are maybe getting in, in my client's way. Um, we're looking at a lot of negative self-talk. Um, you know, so issues related to maybe self-esteem, um, effectiveness on, uh, how they're maybe going about the things that they're trying to, to do. Um, you know, but, for, and, you know, in a lot of my therapy clients, though, I'm doing the same thing that I'm doing in, with coaching clients. The, with the one difference is because they're in my office. They can then submit their that session for insurance. So there, there is a logist, just a logistical, you know, because of the legal, um, uh, the, the way the law is, um, people have to be in my office in order to submit it for insurance. Now, when I'm doing coaching, which is, you know, um, well, I do some coaching in my office. Um, most of my coaching is uh, virtually, um, so usually on you know, like the Zoom platform. Um, and, you know, with that, so we're really focusing on productivity. Um, while there are things where we talk about, you know, related to kind of uh, challenging automatic thoughts and beliefs, because um, I do think that's a really important part of understanding what drives our behavior um, when it comes to dealing with issues related to maybe um, past traumas, um, where there's a lot of emotional um, kind of challenges that are at play. Um, that's going to be where, where coaching is really not appropriate and where it's more, uh, um, suited for a therapist. Now I have worked with clients who are in therapy and who, um, coaching clients who are in therapy and I've collaborated with their therapist to make sure that they're, that it, being, uh, having them as a coaching client will be a good fit. Um, because, you know, I, I don't want to take somebody on who really needs more therapy, um, when they're calling for coaching. And a lot of clients don't really know the difference. If you had to sum up the difference in one sentence, what would it be? Caroline, I do not like summing things up in one sentence. <laughs> I, know, I know you don't. <laughs> the difference in one sentence. Um... It's dealing with less emotional stuff. Like with coaching, it's with with therapy. You're dealing with it's coaching and emotions. With therapy, it's more of just the the actions and the thoughts, with less of the emotions. With with I know I'm now I'm, I'm going to run on sentence now. Uh, okay. with, <laughs> I won't correct this one. <laughs> um, so I mean, yeah, I think that's the the main the main difference. Um, and you know, as a therapist, I think it's also good that I'm able to identify when I'm uh, screening a client. You know, what they're really presenting challenges are. Are they dealing with depression? Are they? Is there possible kind of PTSD? Um, is there an anxiety disorder? So I'm I'm kind of screening and weeding some of those things out to see what's going to be most appropriate for those clients. I know for me as a coach, one of the things that I really try to assess in, in that initial call is coachability. Mm -hmm. How do you determine if somebody is coachable? 
Hmm. That's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, I do use some, uh, like questions that I ask clients, but a lot of it honestly is based on an intuition and, mm -hmm. you know, where does the conversation go as we're talking? Um, if they start talking about, you know, things in their childhood and, and I think, you know, as I'm kind of talking, uh, through this, I think when I hear people talking stories about their past, I dig in more because I question them if they're coachable. If I talk about where they, if they're talking about where they really want to go, um, is it in a forward direction? Um, that to me, I think is a more of a sign of coachability. Um, I mean, to me, the, some of the obvious things, especially when I'm working with, um, um, people who are in their either late teens or early twenties, who really wants the coaching? Is it their parents who want their kid to be, co you know, it's because mm -hmm. if, if the, if the, the client doesn't want it, then they're not coachable. I mean, that's, that's kind of the position that, that I take. Um, if they want to grow, if they are aware of their challenges, if they want to learn, um, then they, they're coachable. I think that, um, when I see a lot of defense mechanisms kind of flaring up, um, then I'm look, also looking at people who, um, may be coachable soon, but maybe need some therapy first, um, and to, to really help them get the most out of coaching. Say a little bit more about defense mechanisms. Um, sure. So, you know, we all have different defense mechanisms as part of our natural kind of human psyche, um, that the, uh, you know, some of it can be, um, you know, I'll give you a great example of one of my, uh, my, my most favorite used uh, defense mechanisms is, uh, intellectualization. So, you know, when I'm dealing with a problem, I, I intellectualize it. And sometimes I don't always pause to, to kind of just observe and, and notice what I'm actually feeling. Um, mm -hmm. which is actually a really important thing to do. Um, cause I think it gives us even more information, uh, as to what's going on. Uh, some people will say, you know, I, I, I can't do it because so and so, you know, it's the, the kind of rationalizations, um, the, oh, it's, it's, uh, that person's fault or, you know, I can't do this because, um, where it's, um, uh, and so some of the defense mechanisms also come into how they rationalize and, and, uh, some of the negative thoughts. And I hear a lot of the, the, I, I never, or I, I always, or, you know, so those are some common, uh, ones. We also have the kind of projection of, you know, well, you know, that's the way my mom was, or the, um, you know, I see a difficulty in, in ownership of owning the challenges. I think when someone can really own it, mm -hmm. um, I think that's, I'm glad, I'm glad I'm actually talking through this with you because it's, it's something that I maybe uh, haven't fully thought through because I think that the ability to own it, I think, might be one of the best indicators of readiness for coaching. How well do you own it? Carolyn, maybe we should create like a, a, a rating scale and just call it the own it scale. Like how, you know, because I think that's that is a huge piece of coaching. It's it's maybe in therapy, you don't really understand the nature of what the challenge is. Mm -hmm. and, and coaching, you get it, you understand it, you've done even some, maybe some of your own research to understand the nature of the challenge, and now you're really ready to move forward and you understand how hard it might be. I think that a lot of times a barrier to owning it is, you know, the missing piece of of knowledge of, of how much ADHD affects people. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of an education piece that is worked into mm -hmm. it. How do you do that with your clients? Well, I think in all the roles that I that I play, um, not just the ones on TV, but uh, the um, uh, in, this role of therapist, the role of a coach, role as a consultant. My main role in all that is to, as the role of an educator, the role of a teacher. Um, I mean, that's um, that really is. It's it's taking people from where they are using information um, to help them grow and realize it's not their fault that they're in these situations, but mm -hmm. let's, let's learn as much as we can about the nature of the problem, um, to really move forward. I mean, that's, that's helped me so profoundly. We know that the ADHD is a disorder that, that education about the disorder makes a huge difference. When were you diagnosed? Uh, when, I, when I was in college and I was 19 after I almost failed out of college. So did you start 
learning about ADHD immediately or was it kind of like, oh, uh, no, it was the, um, so I got the diagnosis. I got a prescription for Adderall, um, which, which you was suddenly great. got more friends. <laughs> Um, you know, well, I suddenly was in the library a lot more and I suddenly realized that I can, I can now, you know, it was that experience that I t- think I talked about in the first episode of, um, I felt normal for the first time. Um, yeah. I, or I read through a chapter of a book and I actually retained what I just read. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean that, that was so powerful, uh, to me. And I realized I, you know, I'm not stupid. Um, you know, it's, or and I started to experience academic success for the first time, really. Um, and, and I had an interest in what I was learning as well, which made a huge difference, uh, for me as well. I realized the importance of interest as an, you know, those intrinsic motivators. And I realized that, you know, people with ADHD, um, you, you kind of have to love what you do. You know, it's for people without ADHD, you know, it's, it's kind of a luxury. It's a, it's a, it's a nicety, if you will, uh, mm-hmm. to like what you do, um, for people with ADHD or any other, I think just learning difference. I think you have to love what you do in order to to be able to, you know, feel good about what you're doing and to be able to feel successful in however way you define success. Did you start studying social work right from the first day of college? Uh, no, I um, I studied how to uh, where I can get beer from, um, <laughs> and then uh... <laughs> and and how to make uh, dreadlocks in your hair. I, yes, I did have, did I, I forgot that I told you that. Uh, so, <laughs> so yes, I did have dreadlocks when I was in college. Um, and then I, I cut them off and like the night before I was having some kind of sort of major surgery. Um, I was kind of freaking out. Um, I think I, they might still be in a jar somewhere. I'm not sure where they are. Oh, um, gross. <laughs> absolutely gross. Um, <laughs> So, no, my freshman year, I was a sort of undecided communications, marketing, advertising major, um, and I did really bad in those classes. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, that kind of shifted my my focus. Um, I actually had, and I'm not sure if I talked about this before on, on the podcast, um, I had a friend uh, in college who was a social work major um, who, uh, you know, convinced me to take a social work class, uh, after I almost bailed out and, and, uh, very skillfully convinced my parents to give me another, one more chance, uh, at college after they already threatened to pull me out. And, uh, if I were then I probably would have pulled me out. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of look back at that and I think, wow, you know, that was, a, that was, um, that was probably very tough for my parents to, to give me that chance. And, uh, I'm glad that they did, but, um, so my friend, uh, my friend Gabe, who uh, encouraged me to take the social work class, was an intro to social work, and it's all about like ethics and policy, and which a lot of people might find boring. I found that fascinating, um, and so I switched my major then, um, and, and uh, kind of fast forward uh, a bunch of years. Uh, this my my friend Gabe, who he was. He was kicked out of school um, at, from Bradley uh, for drug possession, um, and mm-hmm. then in his in his last semester of uh, of grad school, he was at Colorado. Um, he uh, he OD'd, um, oh. and uh, and so you know it's uh, there's really not a day that goes by that I don't think about that. Um, it's uh, it's also I think one of the reasons that I don't really do a lot of work with with drug and alcohol uh, addictions because it's it just it, it's too close to home, um, uh, and um, you know, my uh, my son his name is Gibson named after my friend Gabe, um, so yeah he uh, Gabe was someone who was a very selfless person, but also, you know, really struggled with addiction. He also had ADHD. Um, you know, he kind of compartmentalized his life in so many ways that, you know, I considered him one of my best friends. And I, you know, learned later uh, that there were so many parts of his life that I did not know. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was so interesting is that as all of uh, his friends kind of gathered, you know, after... Uh, after he died and we all kind of learned that there were parts of him that nobody knew like he really uh, departmentalized um you know so many areas of his life um so it's yeah it's uh it's i still can't believe he's gone there's there's still times where this has been 10 years now 
um, or I want to call him and tell him something and um, can't. I'm so sorry. Yeah. It's hard to lose a, somebody who has made such an impact on you. Yeah, yeah. He's a, you know, he's a very um, humble person who, he, I mean, he would, he uh, was a volunteer in the, the, you know, the Big Brothers program. Mm -hmm. um, and he was doing it for like years and he never told anybody. He just did it. Like he would volunteer in the different places and like he never made anything about it. I mean, he's... Um, you know, he was just a really good person. And, uh, so I, I do what I do every day in, in large part, um, is, is, um, dedication to him. That's wonderful. Through his inspiration, you have made a difference in a lot of people's lives. Thanks. And that's a really amazing way to honor him. What do you think would be the one thing that um, the one thing about you and who you are as a person that Gabe would want most people to know? Hmm. It's a hard question to answer because I felt like he you know, he's the type of person that that um, you know kind of lived the idea of, you know, do, do good as if nobody were watching, you know? Um, right. and so I think that there is part of me that, that does that. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that. You can come back to that sometime. Okay. Your mind will keep working on that. I'm sure. So th the other thing that you, um, well, that has been really meaningful f for me, is the Facebook community. Mm -hmm. Did you start that at the time that you started your podcast? Yeah, I started that pretty early on, I think, um, when I started the podcast. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I didn't really have a grand plan with it. Um, you know, I sort of had a, a feeling about what I wanted it to be like and what how I wanted it to, to, to grow. Um, but I didn't it wasn't really clear to me. So I was, uh, um, I was just kind of going and each kind of step along the way. Um, you know, I, I would go in different kind of Facebook ADHD based Facebook groups and kind of just engage with people and, and talk with people and kind of say, Hey, I'm, I'm starting this podcast. Um, so it's a lot of just kind of individual conversations with people. Um, so I kind of invited my, the first like 20 people to the group that way. Um, and I've very intentionally have grown it slowly. Um, you know, we have just over 200 people in the group now. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I screen everybody that comes in. Um, you know, so I have a conversation with, with people. Um, you know, cause I find a lot of people will find the group and have never heard of the podcast. Um, mm -hmm. and so, you know, that's, I'm still kind of figuring out what is the best way to engage with people that way. Cause I know there are people that just are just looking for an ADHD group. Um, cause there are a lot of ADHD groups. Um, and so I've kind of taken, I've shifted it from, um, you know, if you're just looking for a, for a group, um, to kind of educating them about it and then kind of telling them, Hey, you can check out the podcast. And, you know, I don't know how effective that's been. I'm still kind of, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning the best way to, to do that. It is time consuming, uh, to, to, um, screen everybody, um, and it's uh, it's hard because I I think right now I have 140 people in the queue of who have requested. Um, I've contacted I hope I've contacted all of them. I haven't gotten responses though from a lot of people. So it's um, and Facebook makes it very difficult to keep that organized <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, as, as a, a group administrator. Um, but you know what I really wanted it to be um, is a place where people can you know show up and and say you know the challenge that they're having but with the desire to to do better um not a group where they can just kind of kind of bask in their adhdness um you know it's like how impulsive can we be how how absurd can we be like that's not what our group is about um i think that's one of the things that really makes this group one of the better groups that are out there i mean i'm in a lot of groups and some of them 
I don't have the patience for <laughs> as a person with ADHD. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you might want to to have a question that's a legitimate question, and midway through, um, you know, one person could tick another person off, and then they start arguing. Yeah, or, yeah. A strange photo appears, and then next thing you know, it's selfie Saturday. And <laughs> right, right, you know, and it's just like there's enough distractions we have in our life that it's, yeah, I, I don't want the group to be one more distraction. Um, you know, I want it to be a group, a, a group where you can come and and say, you know, I'm struggling with staying focused, and uh, you know, here's what I'm trying to to do to um, you know, kind of maintain. Um, or increase my, my level of focus. You know, I also think that collectively, this group has got to have a pretty high IQ. I'm just going to say that. You might be right about that. Um, <laughs> and not just because you're in it, Carolyn. Yeah, I know. I know I, know I raised the bar some. But <laughs> honestly, I've gone to this group with tech questions. Um, just yesterday I did, actually. But there's always people who've got, you know, really good answers mm-hmm. that are accurate. Um, they, you know, and they engage with with whoever's asking you know, for further information. Mm-hmm. And then they check back. It's like there's little mini groups of accountability partners in there, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other big... thing, too, that I noticed, there's not a lot of, of emotional overreactivity in the group. And what I've been, uh, what's been really neat for me to just see is, you know, I, where I'll be following a thread and, uh, you know, cause I, I'm, I'm not in there all the time, you know, I maybe check in a couple of times a day. Um, and there's times where I'll go a day or two and, and I'm not, I don't check it and I'll see uh, where there were these moments where a conversation really could have gone south and members of the group like brought it back. And I, it's, which is just like, it's amazing to me. Um, you know, so it's, it's really people respecting each other's, you know, feelings, you know, it's, we are real people behind our, you know, our computer screens. And I think that it's a very respectful group. It is. And not only is it a group that respects people's feelings, I think it also respects the curiosity that is inherent within us, especially those of us who have ADHD. I mean, Mm -hmm. there are some people in the group who don't have ADHD. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, um, one of the, it's funny that I, you know, I, so I added in this, this Facebook group and a Facebook group is a, a communication group that's all in written communication. And I don't really like to write. So it's sometimes it's, a, you know, I'm reading through these, these, uh, a lot of these, these posts and threads and my interactions are, I click like, and that's about it sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's like, I'm doing what I can do without it being all consuming to me. Um, you know, occasionally I'll give a more elaborate post on there, but uh, it does that, that doesn't always come easy to me to, to write out a, you know, a, something that's meaningful, that's thoughtful, but that's also brief, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, cause it's, it's um, to manage a community uh, is, you know, it's, it takes time. It does. I mean, you, you have you have a lot of balls in the air. I'll say. I'm yeah. so curious as to what other metaphor you were thinking about I know. using. I was thinking of a couple of different ones, um, <laughs> but really balls in the air because to me it's like there are moments when we've been witness to the times when you're juggling those and it's like, Oh no, I'm going to not catch this one over here. I think one of the perfect examples was the episode that you did in your car. Mm. The ADHD at 55 miles an hour. Yes. I really loved that one. Um, It was, and this one of your qualities that I think is most endearing is your authenticity, Mm -hmm. but we, really saw it there <laughs> how how much my ADHD sometimes impacts me you mean yes yeah yeah it does um I work really hard to do what I do um I still you know that I think I and I've mentioned this on a past podcast uh about that episode that to me the the uh 
listener who I think is either in e an email or a Facebook message um, said to me that they are beginning to wonder if I actually had ADHD because I seemed so together. <laughs> to me, that's still like one of the best compliments I think I've ever gotten. Um, uh, cause I, I work my butt up at this and I, you know, I don't know if you ever experienced this, Carolyn, but I often feel like I'm on the edge of like, of everything falling apart. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to, you know, and it's not that it is always like about to fall apart. It's, this is like, it's internal sort of feeling that like, I'm, that I'm going to forget something that I'm going to, um, you know, just not be able to kind of gather my mental bearings uh, for, you know, an extended period of time. But like, you know, I look at the evidence and it's like, yeah, I have my days here and there. Um, but it's not like I've, you know, I don't have evidence in my, in my, in my history to say that I'm going to completely fall apart. Um, so it's, you know, I think we all struggle with this idea that, you know, we feel something, but we have to, you know, and I work with my clients on this too, is that feelings are not facts that we have to mm -hmm. kind of acknowledge what the feeling is, respect the feeling for what it is, respect the thought for what it is, but then look for evidence, you mm -hmm. know? And so to do what I do, I'm very uh, mindful with my own thoughts, the, both the, the, those kind of automatic negative defeating thoughts. Um, Cause I, I have them. Um, mm -hmm. I just, you know, I, I don't give them more power than they deserve. Um, you know, I don't ignore them, but I, I just acknowledge them and I notice them. Um, and it's something that I have to, that I work on every single day. When you started this podcast a year ago, where did you think it was going to go? Um, I had no idea. I was kind of taking it, uh, a couple episodes at a time. Um, you know, cause when I started, it was just, you know, it was just me. It was a solo show. Um, I wasn't doing interviews. Um, and then I had, I think it was episode, uh, 15 with, uh, with, uh, James Hickman, um, who, um, you know, sent me that email and, um, about his struggle with, with, uh, alcohol and, um, realizing that he needed to treat his ADHD. And, um, and then I, uh, had a, I, the idea after I recorded the, um, my reading of his interview, um, that I wanted to just see kind of where he was from the time that he, he sent me that, that email. And so I, a, what was, was what intended on being a five minute kind of just like, Hey, how, give us an update. So we know kind of mm -hmm. how you're doing turned into my first interview. Um, and I, it, it was awesome. Like, I mean, it, it was, it was fun. It was, uh, it allowed, it allowed a story to be told in a way that was very, um, I think, uh, um, both respectful, important, and give, give, given a lot of information all in the, the realm of a story. Um, I'm, I'm all about storytelling. I think it's, I think that is important as education about ADHD is by understanding the science behind it. I mean, let, let's face it. Would we rather hear a lecture about statistics on ADHD or, or would we rather hear a bunch of stories that, that kind of show what those statistics mean in real life? It, you're asking a professor who has yeah i am asking I'm, i am asking a professor that uh no, I, I know it's definitely i see more glassy eyes when i don't put it in perspective of of real people um doing real things that they can relate to yeah you know i i mentioned earlier that one of my coping strategies is intellectualization the mm. research allows me to do that you know <laughs> Well, um, and, and the stories allow you to take what you've been into, take the data that you've been looking at that you enjoy, but the, the stories are really a medium to mm -hmm. present that. Mm -hmm. It's like tricking, tricking the listeners like Tom Nardone, <laughs> who are so anti, um, anti-data, anti-science. He's full of it. He loves it. Oh, no, he's, he's, he's he, getting the science. He gives the science. Yeah, he's, he, he does science experiments in his, in his room all the time. You ever see all the dishes that are behind him? Oh, I know, the mold growing experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, oh, actually, he had a science experiment on um, how to 
microwave Brussels sprouts or something. <laughs> yes, Tom, Tom Nardone is a, um, he's a good friend of mine. We talk about him every time. We really do. He's, he's <laughs> the most talked about person on my podcast. All right. So let's talk then about your most favorite podcast episodes that you've recorded. My most favorite podcast episodes. Besides mine. Of course, besides yours. Um, it's good to recuse yourself when you're the mm-hmm. interviewer. Um have I ever told you the story of when I was in, in college about how um, – so I wrote this paper, and um, and I thought that the word recuse was rescue. And so I, <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote this whole paper using the word rescue, and what I really meant was recuse. Um, so, yeah, sorry. I, 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 I chose to go down that rabbit hole, but now let's come okay. back to uh, um, favorite episodes. Um I definitely, uh, my interview with Russell Barkley, uh, you know, two episodes ago now was probably at the top. Um, that was, uh, that, that was probably a highlight of my year. Um, so I really, really enjoyed that. And not just cause I got to interview, uh, Russell Barkley, but I, I felt like I was if, like, okay. If you guys could see his face now, he's got like this big, <laughs> like, Grin on. <laughs> and now I'm blushing. Um, he is blushing. I was able to kind of, I felt like I was able to bring out the person of who he, who he kind of is, you know, not just this like, you know, up on the pedestal, you know, authority and ADHD. Um, and to me, that was really important. Um, and I, I he, he, you know, the fact that like, I was able to show that he's this really nice guy and, um, um, who likes a good steak? <laughs> who, who likes a good steak? Yeah, that. Yeah, that was. Um, no, I, that was a lot of fun. Um, my other favorites. Um, one of my favorites, I think, uh, was with Jerry Mills, which was at the, the Chad conference. Um, the episode uh, is episode, I think it was 39. The title, I think it was a Don't Doubt the Dream. Um, he's a musician. I mean, he, he uh, played a couple songs during the interview. That, that was one of my favorites. That was so much fun. It gave me the feeling that I want to quit my job and like start a band. Um, <laughs> I, I, I get that feeling once you in a while. You had to rein that impulsivity in. You know, have you ever seen the movie August Rush? I suck at movies. I only know like four. I'm the same way. So uh, this is one of the ones that I, so after I saw August Rush, it's about, it's about this kid who's like a music prodigy and like, so anyways, I, after I watched this movie, I had such a strong feeling of like, I'm doing the wrong thing with my life. I need to quit what I'm, <laughs> I need to quit what I'm doing. And, and, you know, I need to get back into music. Cause I almost did, you know, I was, I almost, you know, did professional music. Uh, um, when I was in, right before I went to grad school, I auditioned with a reggae band and was offered a gig to travel with this reggae band. Um, and I, you know, I, I really debated whether or not I, I do it or not. And I thought that if I did it and had any the success The interesting thing it, is I'm not picturing that because, well, first of all, you no longer have your dreads. I know, but secondly, yeah. remember when you did the episode with Pat um, and you were trying to do those accents <laughs> that you sucked <laughs> I would be the white Jew in the Rastafari band. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. I might want to edit that out. I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, no. Well, that's authentically you. <laughs> and I always say I might want to edit that, but I never edit that. Um, so I'm just kind of thinking through, like, should I have said that? And so you're kind of, I'm just thinking out loud. Um, my, oh, my other favorite yeah. episodes... Um, I really enjoyed the, um, I think it was episode 23 with, uh, with Linda Rogley, um, mm-hmm. about just, it was about being authentic and kind of coming out as with ADHD. And I just remember that being a very emotional interview. It was just after, it was after a presentation that she gave, um, at the, I think it was at the ADA conference. Mm-hmm. Um, I think so. yeah. And that was a, that was a wonderful interview. I gotta have her on again. Um, I also um, I also really liked um, episode I think it was eight on motivation because um, I did some like character voices. I don't know if you've listened to that one. 
I have not listened to that one yet, but that should be a fun one to transcribe for you. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I did this whole, like, these character voices of, of dopamine and... and uh, Do them. <laughs> Give us a recap. You got to go back and listen to episode eight. Come on. I think we. Should, I think what we'll do is we'll uh, here. We'll, we'll we'll cut it in right here. Here's a recap of episode eight. Dopamine, where have you been? Uh, sorry, I got distracted around the temporal lobes. You know. All that fidgeting your body has been experiencing? Yeah, well, sorry about that. And sorry about not coming up to you during last week's nuclear meltdown. There was all kinds of activity going on in the amygdala. And I couldn't even get through to you. I really tried. I did. I just couldn't get through. Huh. That's funny. I don't even remember that. So, what should we do today? Uh, you tell me. I'm just here to help you get stuff done. You make the decisions around here, though. Yes, that is true. I certainly do make the decisions around here. But it just seems like I can't get anything done when you're not around. What are you talking about? You get plenty of stuff done. You only see what I get done when you're around. When you're not around, that's a whole other story. Wait, so when I'm not hanging around, you just sit and twiddle your thumbs, stare at the wall, and play Candy Crush? Is that what you're telling me? It's not like I do that on purpose. It's just the way it works. Believe me. I wish I could get more done when you're not around. I just... can't. Can't you just use willpower? You mean... No one has told you yet. Told me what? Dopamine, you are what powers my will. You are my willpower. Don't you know that? That's a big responsibility to have. Don't you think that that could be a problem? I know I'm not that dependable. Well... I have some good news. I've been learning some strategies, and I think I have a few tricks that we could use so you stay around longer and more consistently. Dopamine, I want to go look at my to-do list, check my calendar, make a five-year plan, go back to college, Write a book. We could save the world. Me and you. Let's do it. But first, I have a toilet to clean. More bills to pay. A phone call to return. And I know exactly where I'll start. Let's go, dopamine. Me and you. Let's get it done. This just feels so good that I think I want to have (laughs) I think I want to have serotonin around. Let's call serotonin. Shall we? So just for everyone knows the behind the scenes, how this all works, is I just made a marker on my audio and I gave Carolyn the cue of let's keep going because I'm going to actually add in the part of episode eight later. But now that you're listening to it, that, yeah, I don't, I have a hard time explaining this. So I'm talking to you now, but it's listened to later. And then, you know, it's just, it's this space time continuum thing that just kind of, uh, I wish we could move on.
<laughs> yeah, well, time, because we know that time is one of the biggest challenges for us. It is? What do you do to keep yourself on time? I know one of the things that you do sometimes is you ask for help, which is very mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you've talked about struggling with is getting home on time. Mm -hmm. Which I've been doing, so, uh, I think that in the last maybe month or two, I've been just, I've been doing so much better with it. Um, I've, uh, it's been, uh, it's been more of a rarity for me to not be home to, to spend a little bit of time with my son, um, which has been, which feels great. I feel like I've really made a lot of good progress, uh, in that, um, I, I use a, a sleep app that kind of tracks my sleep and just the last two months, you know, my, the, the number of hours I'm in bed is, is, is gone up that the time that I go to bed is, is getting earlier. Um, and my sleep quality score has improved. So it's, and I, and I feel it. I definitely feel it. What keeps you from getting out of the office door? I have a really bad case of one more thing. I this. Okay. Um, you know, my, my meds have worn off. I, um, you know, I, I think that part of it is like, you know, I think I might be a little bit more creative at night, or at least that's what I tell myself. Um, and so what, I, but what I realized is that yeah, that's not completely true. I just happen to, um, d have done things more creatively at night, but it sort of backfires when I stay up late to, to do things that are creative. Um, you know, you can be structured with creativity. I think this whole notion that you have to just wait for creativity to come. I, I think that's this, I think it's a fallacy in a lot of ways. Um, I think we have to put effort into being creative and know that sometimes that's not going to come, but if you keep working at it, it, sometimes it does come. Um, so, so I you're saying that we need to be creative about how we think about creativity. Um, well, I, th I think we have to push back in some ways against thinking that we need to wait for that moment of inspiration to try to be creative. Um, I think that we can schedule creative, uh, create, create, creativity. <laughs> yes. Creativity, creative time, um, time to be creative. So that's what I was trying to say. Um, have we ever talked about the fact that I'm naturally a mumbler? No. Um, although actually I think we might have, um, I can hear, but I'm very good uh, with auditory skills. Um, I can hear what words you are very intentional when you enunciate with. Yeah. It's very obvious as a listener. Because for me, it's it's interesting for me. when the when the microphone is on or when I'm giving a presentation, I'm very... Um, Important is one of the words. That I say? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. It's you say that word slower than you say other words, but your enunciation of that word is very careful. Interesting. Is that another one? No. <laughs> now I'm totally wondering about what other words do I? I'll, I'll point them out to you. Okay. All um, right. Not we, now, but we, we should do like a a, a a listening party or something at some point, and uh, you know we can go through and and critique what I do. Uh, okay. <laughs> like that sounds that fun sounds to fun. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, as, um, you know, as my, can I call you my editor? I don't know. Sure. Sure. We're like, eh. <laughs> it's like, if you start paying me, you can call me the editor. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you definitely take pride in, I think some enjoyment and pointing out my typos and I know that you enjoy it. So I give you all these opportunities. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I I am the type who will correct graffiti <laughs> with, with spray paint. Um, I plead the fifth on that, <laughs> but um, I yeah I don't know it. So you're really, you're like the grammar police. I am to correct and serve. <laughs> 
ADHD Rewired listeners, join me this summer as we turn up the heat on getting things done. The ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group has started early registration, and screenings are underway now. Early registration is open to a limited number of people, and early registration promotional pricing ends Monday, June 1st. The first two groups sold out, and this group is already filling up. Up. Schedule your free screening call with me now. Go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. Or call me at 224 993 9450. Again, 224 993 9450. And prepare to get your ADHD rewired. Zoom video conferencing is so easy to use that with all the extra time I saved not having to configure complicated settings, I recorded this promotion. Support ADHD Rewired and check out Zoom video conferencing. Go to erictivers.com slash Zoom. Again, that's erictivers.com slash Zoom. Get a Zoom room. Boom. Boom boom trial.com slash ADHD rewired for your free trial.com slash ADHD rewired trial.com slash ADHD rewired Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD rewired for your free audiobook download. <laughs> All right, um, next question. Or should we, you know what? We had talked about, um, instead of doing an official kind of break, break. during the show, to that we should, because you are probably the biggest Audible fanatic that I know. I just got some new badges, too. Yeah, what's, what's your latest badge? Uh, I don't know. I'm on airplane mode, so it doesn't ring during here. But they just gave me a whole slew of badges. Yeah, can you see what you are? Um, while you're in airplane look. mode? No, turn off airplane mode. But while you're uh, while you're looking for it, there's a um so I'm listening to this audiobook right now and it's it's hilarious because so I downloaded this book. Oh, I can. Sorry. That I downloaded this book that I thought was something completely different than what it actually is. What? The book is called um Masterminds Mastermind and Wingmen and I thought it was like a business book about like masterminds. You know, like the mastermind group where it's people who are all um, trying to help uh, a person who was in the hot seat. Um, and I actually do this in the coaching group and the ADHD rewired coaching group is where someone will present a, a specific problem. They have three minutes to kind of lay out the nature of the problem. Um, and then everyone in the group kind of gives ideas. Um, and then you, you leave this, the session uh, with a bunch of new ideas regarding that specific challenge that you're having. So I thought this was a group, a, a book about that. It turns out it's nothing about that. Uh, it's about, um, like raising boys and, and boyhood and kind of, Oh, net, really? It's, it's amazing. It's a really, really good book. And I think it, it in a lot of ways sort of echoes or complements a lot of the, the work of Brene Brown. Um, you know, it's, it, it really helps parents how to have difficult conversations with, with your kids and understanding some of the dynamics of, of, uh, the differences between boys and girls and talks a lot about how, how to teach kind of, uh, you know, social empathy online, um, how to have the, the difficult conversations, how, um, that, that boys are just as feeling as girls. And, um, you know, we, as a culture, we, uh, put boys in this kind of, uh, this almost box of what it means to be a man and, uh, which does a huge disservice, uh, to boys, um, you know, because when we think about you know what is what is masculinity, it's you know be strong, um, be non-emotional, um, work hard, and um, and I think Brene Brown talks about this too, uh, with uh, how she talks about um, uh, masculinity, and you know also you have to have a a, a um, component of uh, homophobia, and you know it's it's so it's this pervasive issue that. Um, and this book does just a really nice job of explaining how we kind of got to this point, how we as a culture reinforce a lot of these these um, issues that 
I don't think we always realize what we're saying and doing when we say and do it. Um, and kind of gu- and really guides parents through how to have these difficult conversations, including things around technology, th- things around bullying and cyberbullying, um, things around how to help uh, how to help your your sons talk uh, to their friends when if they're if they're being bullied. Um, I just, it's just, it's a really powerful book, um, and I, it was a great mistake <laughs> that I started listening to. I love to. mistakes like that. Yeah. So is that what you're reading now? Yes, yes. A Mastermind and, and Wingman. I just started um, last night a book called Miracle Boy. Mm-hmm. Well, Miracle Boy Grows Up. It's how the disability rights revolution saved my sanity. Hmm. And I'm really enjoying it so far. Um one of the things that you and I talked about with books is that when we get asked about books that somebody who um, has ADHD is, is looking for advice, so they, they're looking for a good book on, a lot of times we don't stick within the world of ADHD books because there's so many wonderful lessons just like what you just said that certainly come into play with you know parenting and so we're gonna we're gonna come back to the the audible conversation in a moment but we uh uh, what, you, what you didn't just hear was about five minutes of me getting frustrated by the sound of this yapping dog uh, that is outside Carolyn's house. And um, I'm still feeling a little frustrated by it. He is. You could see it, or this is another time when you should be able to see his look on his face. I don't have a dog. Um, it's not my neighbor's dog. It's a dog that must be down. I mean, I kind of live in the country. I don't even have houses behind me. So it's got to be down the road, but it's a yippy. It's, it's beyond and annoying. I feel your pain <laughs> because I get this too with the the noise. You know, when I'm when I'm working, I get so distracted by noises, and I'll admit sometimes it's my children. You know, because mm-hmm. they go into these character voices that um, I'm a, I'm on the edge because these characters sound like at any moment someone's going to get hurt so it's hard for me to focus Mm -hmm. because my mom instincts kick in but then i get angry because it's taken me so long for me to do what i want to do so you're saying it's like it makes you angry the fact that it's making you angry i do get angry because i'm getting angry about it you know um there's what are you going to do my heart rate's definitely faster than i want it to be right now because of it so what do you normally do then when this happens? Well, I'm not, you know, uh, I am recording a podcast about one hour a week. So it's, uh, um, I don't know if I've ever had a dog barking situation. I probably have. Interesting. Because, you know, as being, you know, trying to be sensitive towards, uh, you know, my listeners, I know that they're going to be possibly annoyed by that as well. So I try to create as the best audio quality that I can. The dog is quiet right now. Yeah, right now. We should continue the conversation about Audible. Okay. So I got a bunch of badges. One of the things that Audible does is it rewards you with random badges that you don't know you needed, but you get excited when you get them. Mm -hmm. And so I got a bunch of them on the 18th. I got about nine of them, but some of them really, you know, reflect the ADHD (sighs) Have you gotten the night owl badge? Oh, I've gotten the night owl badge. Let me see which what badges I have. Um, I, I know I got high noon. Have you got? I got the like the the dabbler. A <laughs> little bit of everything. Yeah, you know, basically, I start a lot of books if five minutes into them. I don't want this one now. So <laughs> it's funny too. Cause when I first, the first time I heard someone talking about like the, the badges for Audible, like, well, what's the point of that? But I think you're getting them and it's the kind of exciting. Yeah. I got the stack badge. So this must be like when I had a little bit of an impulsive moment with buying <laughs> books. I'm, I'm stacking them up, you know, um, the repeat listener badge. Well, this has something to do with the fact that my memory may not at times be the best. So sometimes I have to go back to listen to something. The Daily Dipper. Yeah. 
at the watchtower bag, which I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> but I can come up with a bunch of images here. Seven day stretch, marathon. I knew I would do that. There's the night owl, the closer, the weekend warrior, the stenographer. I do take a lot of, um, put a lot of like notes into my books. So what other books have, um, have you read recently or listened to? Oh, do you know what I, do you know what I put in to be? I applied to be hmm. a Goodreads librarian. What does that do? Okay. Well, the Goodreads librarian helps to maintain the list of books that are there. Okay. So sometimes, you know, you might go to put a book and put a comments about a book and the book's not there. Mm-hmm. Or uh, maybe the description has grammar errors in it, needs some fixing, things like that. Um, somebody might request for a book to be added to the stacks. And so the librarian would go and find it and things like that. Um, I, you know, I, I actually have three books that I'm four books right now that I'm doing the miracle boy grows up that I just talked about. Mm-hmm. There's one that I will probably do later. It's really quick. It's called your greatest power. Um, it's really, it's about the power of choice. Mm. You know, a lot of times people face situations and they don't realize that they've got a choice. Mm-hmm. Um, unlocking potential, which is like a business coaching book. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then this one I'm reading again called You Are a Badass, which I I enjoy this one. I've heard good things about that. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. It's a mindset book. It's a book to help people to just like wake up and, you know, smell their awesomeness. So it's a book that Tanner Doan should read. Yeah. <laughs> um, Actually, I think it's really good for um, women, 20s, 30s. Okay. You know, what about men? Really, I think it's men. Yeah, but I think it's, I think it's actually geared more towards women. Oh. Okay. I'm not sure. So what does it mean if I still want to read it? It means that you're an equal opportunity reader. Okay. Um, have you read or listened to uh, uh, Complaint Fle- Complaint-Free Living? No, but I need Complaint-Free Living. So I, I just listened to that last week. Um, really good. The whole, the whole concept is um, to try to go 21 days without complaining or gossiping. Um, and so this guy that, that did this, uh, who wrote the book, um, I think he's to something with his church. And um, so the whole idea is you get you can go on their website and order this. It's a purple bracelet. And so each time you complain, you have to move your, the bracelet from one side to the other. So it's kind of a behavioral uh, kind of concept. Um, and, and he said it took him about eight or nine months uh, to, to achieve and you can get this bracelet, uh, for free. You'll send anyone who wants it. Um, but it's a really, really interesting concept. And the thing that I, uh, um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you don't think you're a negative person until you start counting how much you complain. Well, wait a minute. What is, is it just complaints that you say out loud? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so- also, it's a mindset book. It's a mindset. It's a behavioral, like, you know, I also felt that there was a little sort of element of the secret in it, which I have mixed mm, yes. feelings about. Yeah. Um, to me, it's like the the principle of, of thinking and ta- and speaking positively. I think that's great, but it gets a little hokey to me. Okay. Because I think it's like just if you just think it, it will happen. It's like no, you have to put a lot of work into it. Mm, the, so you're not a ruler of I'm the not, secret. I'm, I'm not a mystic manifest your power no like positive thinking goes a long way speaking positively goes a long way um you know and i do even think to some degree even though i don't always want to admit it out loud that i believe in like energy for like fields and forces and of our thoughts and you know even though i know we can't really measure that yet like on an intuitive level i sort of think about it even though like as a very rational science-based person i'm like do i really want to admit that out loud <laughs> um, that's okay yeah no i mean it's whatever it, works for you 
And so, you know, it's, but the idea that it's like this very direct, like, you know, if I think it and really imagine it, you know, it's going to happen. It's like, no, because sometimes bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. And there's a lot of chance and coincidence in life. I think it's when when you find peace in finding meaning in something mm-hmm. and that can move you forward. Yeah. And it doesn't matter where. Yeah. I'm also a person who um, I'm really big on coincidences and timing. Yeah, I um, I, I know you are. Yeah. I roll my I eyes every time. Yeah. It what? I roll my eyes every time that you tell me about your coincidence. I'm just going to tell you that. Cause, Why? Because I care about you. It's my, it's maybe it's my own judgments. It's my own. Um, is she for real? Because you're you're this like academic person, and then you're coming with like these like tarot cards that you read, and and I'm just like really. Oh, I don't read them. People read those ones for me. And I, and I'm, Look, I'm, I'm often I'm often wondering be happy because, because it's, so it's wait, like, so brilliance, I'll, brilliance, brilliance. You know what <laughs> yesterday said? What big pot of money coming your way? Like I want to believe that. Of course. Do you know the the history of astrology? No. So you know, so astronomy is science. Astrology is science fiction. Okay, and there's a so in. <laughs> In our in our in the northern hemisphere, we have our um, our thirteen major constellations, right? Now, in how many signs are there? I don't know. There's twelve. 12. Yes, so there's, there's, 12, there's twelve signs. Do you know what sign is conveniently left out? No. The uh, the asterism or uh, constellation of um, Ophiuchus, which is the sign of death, and in uh, in you know year, many many years ago. Um, fortune telling's big business, and if you happen to be born during the sign of of the underworld, the sign of death, that's kind of bad business. So what do they do? Let's just get rid of that one. Okay. So people I feel like you're taking this way too personally. So, <laughs> it's okay. So so, so I, I'm, I'm sort of an astronomy geek. Um, so your astronomical sign is often different than your astrological sign. So if the energies of the planets and everything do happen to have an impact on us, I'm not saying they do, I'm not saying they don't. I'm saying I don't know. But if they do, you got to look at it through the realm of astronomy, not astrology, because astrology is not accurate. That's really not the kind of coincidences that I was talking about, though. (laughs) But you had your moment, and you got that off your chest, and now we're all happy. Carolyn, I feel better. I was thinking, like, <laughs> the timing of things, you know, the day that you, um, like, you might lose a job and then get a job the same day, or um, you might you might need a really cute pair of shoes and you go there to the store and there's, like, one pair. I had that experience all size. the time. <laughs> well, it's on sale. It's just your size. And it was, like, you were you were meant to have them. Yeah, I um, I don't think that way. How many pairs of shoes do you have? It would be interesting to know how many people who are listening. Um, oh, think, Shopper's th- Fate. Sh- that's a thing? Shopper's yeah. Fate? Yes. I'm speechless. I don't, it's a real thing to me. I don't know if it's really real. <laughs> But they're build. They're in the process of building like the biggest mall in the country, mm-hmm. and it's called Destiny. Hello. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Speaking of things that might be coincidence or random. Okay, I roll. Go ahead. I, I'm, tr- I'm trying to. I'm trying to give you a lob to kind of go into the random question around. Oh. Okay. Sometimes those have- cues just fly right past. <laughs> well, because I thought you were gonna do the whole like. No, it's time for the random question. Oh, now. yeah. Oh, and let me go back a little bit, too. Um, because our, the whole idea of talking about Audible would be really good if I talk about that you can get a free audiobook download by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD rewired. <laughs> What's that link again, Carolyn? Um, Give it to me in your best like radio personality Audible. voice. No, I'm not ready for that. Oh, come on. Audible.com slash ADHD rewired. That's your best radio personality No, voice? it's not. It's going to be like this, right? Ready? So you got to sit up nice and tall. Got to inflate your ego a little bit. 
And you can get a free download at ADHD Rewired. No, that's not my link. I always do that. Um, See, you can't even get it's it right. right. It's true. It's true. Um, you know, I want to focus on like performing. You note in front of you. You know, I, um, all right, let me, let me try to stay focused here. Um, did I tell you that I've cut my dose of Adderall in half over the last three weeks? Yes. Remember that was part of like a conversation we had about like, maybe you should do that. Yeah. And, and I did. Um, so, um, what made you decide to do that? Anxiety. I was feeling a lot of anxiety. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, uh, kind of annoying. And so I figured, let me just cut it in a half for a day and see what happens. And I felt a lot better. Um, and so I've, I've been staying at a, at a 30 milligram dose and it's, uh, it's been well, helping. Although you know, this week bodies change, their life circumstances yep, change, yep. you know, it, to think that medication is going to stay the same forever. It's, it's kind of like the people who might try one thing and be like, ah, oh, that didn't work for me. It's like, we'll try something else. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, to, so I know what the research says that well, most people's bodies like a, do at some point get used to the medication. Um, but you know, it's, I'm different. No, no, I'm not. Be thankful that you don't have to worry about menopause. <laughs> but I worry about menopause, which yes. is, which is a real thing, by the way. Oh, well, I told, I never doubt that. Um, sometime, and I'm sure you can find a book all about that at audibletrial.com slash ADHD rewired. (laughs) What about Zoom? Get a Zoom room. Get a Zoom room. Get a Zoom room. Can you carry a beat? Can you like do some beatboxing for me? No. Come on. I'm awful at that. I'll make you look good. Give it a try. Like, okay. Oh, you might be right. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, see, I, I get it. <laughs> All, right. All right. I have some random question rounds. Okay. Just questions. So, remember, we agreed. You said you were going to do the. Okay, now it's time for the. Oh, that, that's my cue, huh? Yes. <laughs> see? And now it's time for the random question round. This is the part of the show that has nothing to do with ADHD, which then paradoxically has everything to do with ADHD. Okay. Are you ready? I am ready. I am not going to ask you what your invention would be. Okay. Okay. Does that bother you that I'm not going to ask you? Not at all. Okay, good. Because your inventions, I think, have been just what you get by secretly stealing everybody else's inventions week after week and reworking them in your head. You know, in like three or four years, I'm going to be like a billionaire because I've know. taken everybody's inventions and ran, ran with them. That's why I'm like, I'm not giving you my Who are you invention. kidding? There's way too much paperwork to fill out for like uh, patents <laughs> and all that stuff. Your inventions are safe with my lack of inaction, my lack of action on those things. So you're fine. Okay. All right. <laughs> Ready? Go for it. If you had the chance to be invisible for one day, what would you do? Wow. If I had a chance to be invisible for one day, what would I do? Um... The problem right now is I'm thinking about of a thousand things all at the same time. Mm-hmm. You only have one day. All right, so I would want to go into like restaurants and then like like take a bite off of someone's food and then watch them be like, what what just happened? Um, now, does my invisibility allow me to interact and touch things? Yeah, they just can't see you. Okay, so they just can't see me. I would want to. Um, I want to go to like some kind of like secret meeting somewhere there where I'm not supposed to be. Um, I would want to, um, who wants to be invisible to go to meetings? No, but like, <laughs> like, or there's like, you know, revolutions being discussed or peace is being discussed or policy about social change. Um, I would want to asked my son this question one time and he said he would go to the movie theater. Hmm. I would also want to go to my son's classroom. That would be fun. Yeah, that would be fun. Um, 
I would also want to ride a bike. That would be oh, awesome. Yeah, just to get people's. Uh huh. Uh mm huh. -hmm. You could ride a bike while holding one of those leash from the fair with the invisible dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? Yep. Do you untie your shoes when you take them off? Sometimes. What was your favorite toy as a kid? I had a few. Um, I loved Matchbox cars. Um, and I would, I would like pretend that they were like, we would be like an, in car accidents. So I'd take a hammer to smash them. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> and my, like one of my favorite was I had this big metal, like Tonka truck that I kind of did the same thing with. Um, I mean, this is like a, like a dangerous metal toy. It was awesome. I when had, he starts chipping off. Uh-huh. Um, I love, I had a Teddy Ruxpin when I was little that I loved. Um, I also wow. had this, this, uh, robot. It was so cool. You push this button and you put like oil in it and it would actually like have this like smoke that comes out of it. And it was, I forgot exactly what its name was, but it did, said something like, I am something, something, the talking robot, blah, blah, blah. It was so cool. That I was, bet. those were some of my favorite toys. Um, Lincoln Logs. I like Lincoln Logs. Um, I'm totally reminiscing right now and I'm enjoying this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what else? Other favorite toys um yeah those were like my main favorite toys what do you think of the toys now they're crappy and break like when mm -hmm. i when i like see like the toys and the action figures and stuff they're they're all made of cheap plastic i'm like afraid to touch them yeah well don't beat them with the hammer i think those days are done here we go. Ready? Yes. What is your favorite pizza topping? I have a few. Um, I want to say I love deep dish pizza. Um, have you ever had your, you're like thinking in a very like, hmm. I'm thinking that's not a topping. Right. So, but I like, uh, so I like a deep dish spinach and garlic pizza. I also like, um, if it's thin crust, I like pineapple and bacon. Um, I like, um, I like pepperoni, but it gives me heartburn, so I don't eat it, so I prefer sausage. Um, let's see, yeah, I, I really like pizza, though. Yeah, so those are, I, I hate black olives. Ugh. I'm with you. All right, ready? Mm -hmm. Do you believe in aliens? Do I believe in aliens? I have no evidence that says that they are not around. I have no evidence that says that they are they are around. I suppose that my thought on that is that there is a possibility that there are aliens. Okay. It, there is something called the Drake Equation, and it, it's the the probability based on the vastness of the universe of what are the what's the likelihood that we are the only intelligent life forms on you know, in the universe. And it's a, the Drake equation would suggest that it is a very low likelihood that we are the only intelligent life form in the universe. Makes sense. Yes. Why do you think Yankee Doodle named the feather in his hat macaroni? <laughs> <laughs> this is a great, great question. Do you think what? everybody knows Yankee Doodle? He will. He, he went not. to town riding on a pony. I know, but is that just a, like an American thing? Us Yankees, you know, it's... Yankee Doodle went to town, Keep going. riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Well, really, it's it's actually a, a sad story. Um, Yankee Doodle was, was struggling with schizophrenia. And... Um, <laughs> no, this is very serious. And um, so he, he did have a friend um, whose actual name was uh, Mac for Tony, um, and every, he kind of had a speech impediment, so people thought he was saying macaroni. Um, and so the story goes that he went to town, he actually escaped from the, uh, at the time they had insane asylums, he escaped from the insane asylum, and um, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to keep a straight face. You forgot where you started, huh? Uh, no, no, no. And so um, he, he found this feather, and it reminded him of his friend Mac for Tony. And so he stuck it in his in his hat because he didn't want to lose his friend. 
and he kept talking about macaroni, macaroni, and they thought he was saying macaroni, but it was really macaroni. And he and, and he, you know, he is probably on too high of a medication a uh, dosage of his medication. Although they didn't have those kinds of medications back then, I don't think. Um, <laughs> and so that is where the story of 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 why Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, which, by the way, it wasn't actually a pony. It was a unicorn. It was a unicorn. Yes. I'm, I, so you knew, you knew that part of the story. I did. You know, there's another childhood song that maybe you, you've got wisdom on this, too, because I've always kind of wondered about this. You know, when it's raining and it's storming and the old man is snoring. It's about brain injury. Did he die at the I end? I think he did. He okay. bumped his head and he and uh, couldn't. He went to bed, bed bumped his head, and he didn't and wake he didn't up, in the, up in the morning. Yeah, yeah, he died of a concussion. Oh, why yeah. do we sing that? Do you ever think about all the ch- like the children's songs and how like awful they are? <laughs> like "Ring Around the Rosie" is about isn't it about the plague? I don't know. Pocket full of po- it's ashes, ashes they all fall down. Like all these kids oh, die. Yeah. Um, um, uh, rock by baby on the treetop. First of all, who puts their baby in a treetop when the yeah, wind blows? When the the trail breaks. R- <laughs> right. Um, you, you know the uh, the original version of um, of uh, what, there wasn't a woman who lives in a shoe. She had so many children. She didn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, she what? Uh, she something something. In in the original version, it goes she whips them all soundly and put them to bed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I read that I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I think I have a book of, of original Mother Goose. Oh, they're awful. They are awful. All right. If you won a yacht, what would you name it? If I won a yacht, what would I name it? My first thought was shiny, but I probably actually wouldn't name it shiny. Um, if I want a yacht, are you about to tell me that I want a yacht? No. Um, not yacht. Like a... not not yet. Not, no. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have to brainstorm <laughs> a little bit because uh, I got to get the bad ideas out first. Um, not yacht. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> It's really bad. Um, if I want a yacht, what would I name it? How big is the yacht? It's big. You know, when I was in high school, I I, uh, I cleaned yachts with uh, one of my friends who started his own like yacht cleaning company. Um, he made a killing. Like, he he paid me twenty bucks an hour to help him out. When I was in high school. Like he was driving his own Lexus. Like he bought doing Aren't you this. in the Midwest? Like where are the yachts? Lake Michigan. Oh. Okay. Um, if I won a yacht, what would I name it? Um, my dingaling. Oh no. No, that's also <laughs> not good. Oh my dingaling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what would you name it? Um, not, not yacht. <laughs> How about yacht two? God bless you. Um, so w- the family boat, we named family times. Family tides. Um, you know what? I think I might name it after my son. That's nice. Yeah. All right. I have one last question for okay. you. Ready? Mm-hmm. If you could teleport by blinking your eyes right now, yes, I would. Where would you go? <laughs> um, oops, where would I go? Yes. The ocean, like somewhere in California where it's like warm. Um, the ocean is kind of a broad answer. I, I get it. Um, so I should be more specific. Um, a warm ocean on the beach. Um. um I would love to have that ability to teleport. I don't like going places. I like to be places. I don't like to go places, though. That's right. It would, like, cut down on, like, all my transitional issues. It's like... It would be... Oh, my gosh. That'd be amazing. Now I hear a child. Do you hear a child in my background? Um... No. 
Do you know what's interesting? I was doing biofeedback before, mm -hmm. um, and I had I had all these sensors on me, and they were helping me learn dia diaphragmatic breathing for relaxation. Mm -hmm. And they could see how, when I was able to master that type of breathing, how uh, my anxiety would go down and, and I would get into just a deep relaxation. Mm -hmm. And there was one day when right outside the room where we were doing it, there was a mom and a child and the child started to cry. And right, it was so obvious, right in the middle of the um, relaxation that I was in, as soon as I, that happened, you could see the little thing on the computer screen, just like go right up and immediately get me right out of the zone. So what'd you do about it? I just had to get back in there. So you didn't like go out and tell the kid to be quiet and no give the parents nasty looks no but it was an interesting piece of awareness for me mm. it was kind of like if you were connected when the dog started barking you would probably see the same thing actually i have a little uh machine i'm not going to attempt to uh, dig through my drawers because it's a big hot mess right now um your but drawers I, but, are a big hot mess right now. Yes. You heard it here. <laughs> um, uh, I have a little machine that you like put on your finger, and uh, it helps you with breathing, and it can detect like your I don't know what it detects, but it helps you get into a better state of breathing, keeping yourself calm. There's an app that you put you, for iPhone where you put it on and you put the, your phone on your chest as you breathe. It's supposed to measure how you know your chest goes up mm -hmm. and down breathe to help you get into that diaphragmatic breathing mm -hmm. i don't know what it's called though yeah, you know there's also you know your your uh, phone can also tell your um your uh, heart rate using the, the camera and the flashlight no yeah it's pretty awesome yeah oh. I, I have an app called uh let's see what's it called um i know that um sleep cycle does it can you can have one of the settings where it will take your heart rate when you wake up um, I'm looking for what it's called. Is it one of the native apps? Mm -mm. Although I wonder if it, it's, it's called Heart Rate. It's made by Azumio. So if you, now you could see it, but nobody else can. So you see how the um, the flashlight yeah. is on? You put your finger right over the light. Oh, and that's then neat. Can you see how it's starting to pick up my heart no, rate? No, it says zero, zero. Yes, yeah, so I am dead. 90, let's see. That's really neat. And you can hear it's beeping. Okay, it's done. What is it? Um, shooting between night. That's kind of high. Ninety-five, ninety-six. What's it called? Um, Heart Rate by Azumio. So why did you get that? It's a way I can track my exercise. One of the things I use it for is sometimes I think I'm exercising. Um, Hard and I put this thing on and I realized um, I could I could step it up a notch still um, so because I think you know for me having feedback as to how I'm actually doing in real time is very helpful you know one of the things that I wanted to ask you was about your favorite um, apps that you use oh my favorite app so now we're going back in Here this conversation are. my favorite apps are Here's a random question what is your favorite app <laughs> Uh, favorite apps are um, Mailbox, um, which is an email uh, application. Um, I like uh, Evernote, Dropbox, Zoom, which you can go check out at erictivers.com slash Zoom. And, get a Zoom uh, room. Get a Zoom room. Um, and just so everyone knows too, I, I only pair up with, with companies who uh, I really like. Um, actually, I had to sort of beg Zoom to uh, let me have them as a sponsor because um, they sort of were like, well, we have affiliate things, which is why I gave you the erictivers.com slash Zoom because the real link is like, you know, 
novel long. Um, so the link is actually on the ericktivers.com slash zoom and um, you, know, you can go free or go pro. It's only $9.99 a month for the pro plan, which means you can have a conversation as, for as long as you want with up to 24 other people, which is pretty what awesome. people are in other countries? Yep. It's to my, the best of my knowledge, it works. I know that when you send an invite to somebody to join you, it will give you an international number because if people aren't on their computer, they can actually call from a phone uh, to join your, your call. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Um, other apps that I like, um, I said Dropbox, um, Calendars 5, that's my Calendars app, um, Sleep Cycle is definitely one that I use every day. You know, the best thing about Sleep Cycle is mm. the intelligent alarm function that it tracks your motion and will actually wake you up during your lightest phase of sleep within uh, like a 20 or 30 minute window. I think that it's actually changed the quality of my life um, because instead of waking up at my an alarm time when I might be in a deep phase of sleep, it wakes me up during a, the a lightest phase of sleep during like a 20 or 30 minute window. And so it's actually easier for me to, to wake up. Hmm. It's pretty awesome. I've been tracking for over a year. So I have a lot of data on me. Do you ever get nervous about how much data is on you? No. I don't. No. I don't know why. Like it's it, maybe I'm maybe I'm foolish to think that. Um, but I don't really care. I mean, it's. I don't know. Am I going to be contacted by somebody to say, "I see that you went to bed late last night"? I'll tell them. I'm sorry. I'll try better next time. But that would be nice, though, because if you have... seriously. Okay. Um, what do you what do you think the next year is going to bring you? Hmm. Fame and fortune. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, you know, I am continuing to try to grow. Um, you know, my my business, my practice. Um, at the same time, I'm trying to also make room for more balance, which I feel like I have been in my life. Um, I am always trying to kind of work smarter, not harder. Um, I know, but I know that when you're starting a business, um, in the first three to five years is it's a lot of hard work. Um, so I am trying to learn how to uh, bring other people on uh, in, in my business, both um, in the coaching realm and um, you know, possibly as also other therapists. Um, I want to do more speaking because I really enjoy that that uh, part. And um, I've, uh, I've got recently I've got some uh, speaking gigs with some schools, which is exciting. Um, and I want to, you know, I would love to, to start doing more like all the workshops and then have a book to also support while I'm, uh, and that I can, um, it will help while doing the workshops. Um, you know, any way that I can help teach people and reach people that's going to be helpful for them, I want to try to, to do. Because, um, you know, information is so needed. And uh, if I feel that I can connect with people and give people those aha moments of helping them understand, you know, the, the, the nature of their struggle and give them tools and strategies and also help with mindset. Uh, that's really what I what I want to do, because I, you know, I because I've struggled so much with a, so many of these things that I truly know, like I, I get it. I know where the challenges are. Um, I know how difficult it can be from both a productivity standpoint and also that emotional uh, standpoint. Um, and so I want to kind of take people from where they currently are and bring them to where they could be. And that's, that's what I'm going to try to do, uh, through, you know, continuing the podcast. I want to do more, uh, uh more webinars. I want to get the, the book, um, that you and I are working on, um, workshops, but did I miss anything? Um, merchandise. ADHD rewired toilet paper, ADHD rewired t-shirts, ADHD rewired mugs. We'll have it all. I should edit that part out too. <laughs> yes. My pulse is 104. Whoa. I know. The ADHD rewired app. What would that do? What wouldn't it do? That's the better question. Transporting. Well, we got to get the transporting taken care of in that app. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. At first, I was putting my finger over the flashlight, and they're like, no, put it over the camera. <laughs> so it, it told me. All right, Karen, then I think we should, uh, we should wrap this up. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Eric Tivers. You've been a wonderful guest. Thank you, Carolyn Targenio. I, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to interview me and to uh, share me with my audience. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds awkward. It totally sounds awkward. I love, um, I love how many moments I have during a show where I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't say that. Uh, That's okay. It's totally okay, you know, because the, the more I do it, the more uh, I get comfortable with making a fool out of myself. Um, what was one of the first emails you got from from a listener when you first started the show? Yes, it was something to the degree of, you know, thank you for, you know, sharing your story and it takes balls to share <laughs> what you are, <laughs> um, which then to, to quote uh, Brene Brown, I had my first vulnerability hangover. <laughs> um, and I've been uh, continuing ever since. Um, and I thought that the feedback that I get from people, uh, it, it encouraged me to continue to do what I'm doing because I know it's making a difference. It is. Definitely is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of ADHD Rewired. And if you're new to the show, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. You could see a full outline of this and all other episodes with all the links and other resources mentioned during this interview at ADHDrewired.com. Help support this podcast by checking out my sponsors. I use Zoom video conferencing nearly every day, and so can you. Go free or go pro. But please, go to erictibbers.com slash Zoom so they know that I sent you. And you can get a free audiobook from Audible at erictibbers.com slash Audible. And next time you shop Amazon, use the Amazon search portal at ADHDrewired.com. Com. A small percentage of your purchase will go to support this show, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. You can also support this podcast by leaving an honest rating and review in iTunes or Stitcher. This really helps other people find this show. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't just be a passive listener, be an active member of the ADHD Rewired community. We are on Facebook. You can like our page, but please submit your request to join our free and growing community. And don't forget to check your other inbox because I screen everybody before they come into our community. And I want to thank Carolyn Dargenio for interviewing me and helping get ADHD rewired, rewired. That was really cheesy. Um, so, but I want to thank you for uh, for doing that for me. I think that was really fun. Um, and I also want to let everyone know that uh, we are still running our fundraising um, campaign. And about the campaign, it's the Not Another One and Twenty campaign uh, that I la launched a few episodes ago uh, when I interviewed Carolyn. Uh, recently, just to remind you, if you did not hear this, um, I, I, a young adult client of mine had died from a diabetic coma. And in his honor, we are raising money to help Carolyn Dargenio's seven-year-old son, who has type 1 diabetes, get a device that will alert his mom if his levels are too high or too low. This device could have saved my client's life. Uh, we are trying to raise $3,000, and we would love if you made a contribution. Go to erictivers.com slash T1D for type 1 diabetes. That's erictivers.com slash T1D, and make a donation. We have uh, we raised about $460. Uh, we want to get $3,000, and I, I really do appreciate you for supporting us. So that's all I got for this week. Until next week. <laughs> <laughs>